everybody. David McClendon. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Joe, for having two professors descend from the ivory tower and stop indoctrinating students for a while to, to talk with you. So, um, as Tim said, I, I look at uh, things a little bit differently than some of the other folks up here. Um, to me, what this election is about, um, many of the other experts will, will say some of the things um, that are very important, but to me it's who comes out, who are the voters in this year's campaign. And I do a lot of polling, and my poll's results are not that dissimilar from some of the other poll results. Yes, North Carolinians are extremely dissatisfied with what's going on in Raleigh and in Washington. 73% of North Carolinians said they were very dissatisfied. But there's where it kind of, you start seeing some differences. Um, we ask questions about whether you were angry or dissatisfied. And anger is a feeling out in the constituents, but it's not all the North Carolinian voters that are angry. They use different language to describe their feelings. Dissatisfied, disappointed, are very different than anger. And so I start looking at different groups of voters that may participate this fall and start asking them questions about what's important to you. And when I ask men and women what are the top issues in 2016, there are some differences in the list. For men, the top five issues are economy, terrorism and national security, that's together, immigration, budget and the debt, they're together, and then taxes. But when you look at North Carolinian women, they say economy, that's always the top issue, health care is their second most important issue, education, terrorism and national security is their fourth issue, and then political partisanship is an important issue for the voters, the women of North Carolina. So when you look at just that difference, between the men and women, you can say, okay, there could be some real challenges going forward for all candidates going into the fall, whether they're Republican or Democrat. So if we say that everyone is angry and angry about the same thing, we're missing it. And really what I'm looking forward um, in the next few months is to see what kind of voter groups are activated by the campaigns, particularly as we head into early fall. Where is the activity coming from? And that's gonna tell me a lot about who's gonna win. Now, I'm gonna give you predictions, but I'm gonna give you my um, presumptions about who's going to vote and what kind of turnout each of these respective groups is going to turn out like. Well, in terms of the primary, I don't put a whole lot of stock into the primary in terms of predicting the general election results. Um, I don't think we saw necessarily that anger go deeply into the down ballot races. We saw, yes, Cruz and Trump do well on the Republican side showing that Republican anger, if you will, or dissatisfaction. But like some of the other panelists have said, you know, some of the other races were pretty predictable. Well, if we go back to 2008 and 2012, how did Obama do well in North Carolina? We've heard about the Obama coalition, made up of five basic groups. Unmarried women, and, North, and Obama won the unmarried women of North Carolina by 22% in 2008. That won him the election but also young voters, African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans. Big gaps in all of those voter categories. Now what's happened to four out of five of those voter categories? The numbers have increased. So you look at unmarried women. Unmarried women nationally are a larger group than married women in terms of eligible voters. We know the Latinos have increased now, they're not a huge percentage of North Carolinian voters, but they have increased. Asian Americans have increased. The young voters, now the millennial generation, those under 30, are as big as the baby boomers in terms of eligible voters. Now, again, we know that baby boomers tend to turn out more than millennials. So that's no, you know, I'm not going to say that the millennials are going to swing this election. But it doesn't take much an increase of two or three percentage points of millennial voters turning out that could swing this election quite a bit. So again, if you keep those sort of demographic facts in mind, um, let's look at some potential um, predictions on my part. First of all, let's look at unmarried women. I mean, they were a big group for Obama in 2008. Um, they were significant for Obama, even though he didn't win North Carolina in 2012, but now they're 26% of the eligible voters. And these women are unmarried for a variety of reasons. They can be single, <coughs> divorced, widowed, et cetera. It doesn't matter. But they're a voting block. 
women outnumber men generally in North Carolina by over a half million registered voters. So again, those of you who are men out there, you are, your numbers are relative to women declining. Um, we look at some of the candidates. We look at Mr. Trump, someone who has been mentioned quite prominently here today. Um, nationally, Mr. Trump has a 70% disapproval rate among women. Those numbers are not all that different in North Carolina. They're slightly different. He's about 63% if you look at the aggregate of the Meredith poll, the Elon poll, the High Point poll. So a lot of people don't like Mr. Trump, but women really don't like Mr. Trump. So with their numbers and their dislike of Mr. Trump, you know, doesn't bode well for Donald Trump in terms of winning North Carolina. But let's look at some more detailed numbers. The gender gap. We've all heard of the gender gap that Democrats tend to do well in terms of women historically. In North Carolina, if you look back over the last few presidential elections, we've seen Republicans win except for 2008. Republicans have won typically when the gender gap is 10% or less. Okay? So Republicans, when they cut that gender gap down, they can win the presidency and, and win North Carolina. Donald Trump, if you look at the aggregate of all the polls, he's at about 22% in terms of voting preferences. I mean, that's almost twice as high. It's over twice as high. And, you know, I really don't think he's going to overcome that gender gap. And women are going to vote. Women tend to vote higher in presidential elections than they do in midterm elections. So their percentage is higher than men. So in 2014, we said, what happened to the women? Well, women don't turn out as much in midterm elections. So this is a presidential year. Women don't like Mr. Trump, and women are going to come out. So that gender gap is going to be significant. Now, what happens down ballot? I do think that if the candidates are Mr. Trump and Mrs. Clinton, I think it's going to be a victory for Mrs. Clinton. But I don't think that necessarily transla translates down ballot. Now, to go to a question that has come up, will Mr. Trump win the nomination? If you just compare where he is in the primary process, primary and caucus process, with Mitt Romney, he is tracking delegate by delegate, week to week, with Mitt Romney. So that does not mean he's going to win the nomination. He might get denied 1237 by Wisconsin, North Dakota, any number of other things. But right now, he's tracking with the most recent nominee. All right, so if we look at what's going to happen in North Carolina um, in terms of 2012, based on my modeling, Republican candidates really are going to need to bring that gender gap down to 8% or less. I don't think Mr. Trump's going to do it, but I do think McCrory and Burr and some of the others could do it. So do I think that the huge gap that Donald Trump is going to face with the uh, men and women is going to be there down ballot? No. The question is how much? What's the difference between what Mr. Trump does with women and other voter groups and what uh, other candidates can do? So how much impact does a Trump nomination have? Well, my prediction in, for the U.S. Senate is I still think Richard Burr has some of the fundamentals in his favor. Um, um, I think Deborah Ross is a good candidate. She's not very well known, and she may not have the money coming in. And if the Republicans, I mean, excuse me, the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee and other groups don't see that she's polling well against Richard Burr, they'll put their money elsewhere because they've got a lot of contests they need to, to fight. So I think Burr may, may pull it out. The governor's race is a real toss-up to me, and it really will come down to who turns out. Um, right now, I, I think that um, um, Governor corey has got a number of problems. He's got low approval ratings, but like we've heard, Roy Cooper is not as well-known as we think he is. We, he's well-known within Raleigh, but you go out into the other areas of the state, he's still got high uh, unknowns. Council of State, um, I do think that some of the Republican members are going to have challenges, but not all of them. The Republican woman, uh, Barry, um, it, we've never had a woman lose a Council of State office uh, running for re-election. So I fully expect all the women to win. And there's no, uh, in her race, there could be an argument that she has not performed her duties as Commissioner of Labor. But in the other races, you know, it's, it's hard to say that Steve Troxler has not done his job as uh, Secretary of Agriculture. So I think in many of the cases, the open seat ones I'm watching, will Josh Stein be able to win over Buck Newton? And again, I think it depends on top of the ticket and really the kinds of groups that come out. Uh, in terms of U.S. House races, I agree with uh, Andy in terms of what's going to happen there. Um, you know, and I won't even presume to talk about various races at the legislature. I'm looking at John Davis, and I always read his stuff to figure out what's going on in legislative races, so it would be kind of presumptuous of me to talk about it. 
But the bottom line is I think this is going to be a good year for uh, the Democratic nominee for president in North Carolina, uh, but not so much. Uh, it's going to be a cakewalk for other Democrats. In terms of the impact of uh, HB2, I don't think the bill in and of itself is going to draw out a whole lot of voters. Right now, millennials are all fired up about that. I've had a lot of college students protest that particular issue, but you know, short memories happen. I think the biggest issue for House Bill 2 is that if jobs start leaving the state, if organizations start pulling jobs out, it undercuts Pat McCrory's basic argument for his campaign that his economic policies have produced the Carolina comeback. And when jobs start leaving, that's a hard proposition to make. So the NCAA is looking at things, and we all know what North Carolina feels about its basketball. So if the NCAA starts making threats and following through with their threats, you know, that could make an impact. So anyway, I'm glad to be joining with you today and looking forward to hearing from other uh, colleagues. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. All right. Well, while we love the speculation and the uncertainty, their next group of folks, um, it keeps them up at night. Uh, they make money off of these candidates. Uh, the consultant section of this, as we like to say. Uh, Kara Bolton is next. She's a former spokesperson for the Democratic Party, uh, former newspaper reporter, so she's got all sides of this uh, under her belt. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Kara Bolton. Hi. Um, I'm going to just sort of speak from basically the heart and from my own personal experience, um, which means that the WTF level will go extremely high. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Joe for inviting me. I'd sent him this sort of photo of me in a hat as a joke because I don't have any of those professional photos. And whenever I try to do the ones where you stand with your arms like this, I look like one third of the all black cast of Charlie's Angels. <laughs> so I just don't do that. That. But uh, after I saw the email where he had our photos and I saw me in the hat, the first prediction I made was that I was going to whoop Joe's butt the next time I saw him. But, um, you know, as, keeping along the lines of the voters and who the voters are and why they're coming out, and, and I have a sort of different perspective about that. Um, you know, we've talked about the anger and the winners and losers of the global economy, and I think it's a mixture of all those kinds of things. Um, think about my thoughts are with my mother this morning. She's um, in the hospital. She uh, had a kidney failure. And so my mom's worked hard all her life. And um, for the first time this morning, she's applying for Medicaid. And um, so things like Medicaid reform, not only in North Carolina, which I think they're doing a great job at, believe it or not, even though I'm a so-called Democrat, um, that uh, in North, uh, Medicaid reform in North Carolina and other states um, is really important to me. And they're important to voters as well. And educators, uh, for example, I work with, um, I work with people who um, work in the charter school arena. And so education is not just a, a thing that, a public policy that exists. It's really real to parents who are trying to figure out how to educate their children so they won't be losers in this economy. Um, also, when we talk about the economy, you know, when people talk about jobs and the Rust Belt, on a very real level, I don't know how many of you have seen the Batman versus Superman movie that just came out, but it costs like 11 or $12. So imagine taking a family of four, then throw in popcorn and a soda, and that's like, you know, that's almost a light bill. That's almost a, a cell phone bill in order to take your kids to see a movie that everybody else is watching. So those things are, are really important to voters. Um, the other thing is that um, when it comes to voters, I think the voter anger and frustration is, uh, Cat Williams, if you're not familiar with the, with the comedian, he's a black comedian, has a perm, and it, anyway, um, he's an African American comedian, and he talks about being a tiger in the zoo. And a tiger in the zoo is like you keep trying stuff, and you keep trying stuff, and nothing works. And that's kind of like what the voters are. They keep trying stuff, they keep trying stuff, and their, their quality of life hasn't increased. And it's like, we tried the black guy in 2008, we tried him again in 2012, and the quality of our life is still the same. Um, and, and so they're now willing to consider a fake candidate with a fake tan, with fake hair, who, um, who's, who, who ran a, a successful reality show 
whose prize was a fake job at a fake company. That's where voters are. And, um, and I'm sorry if you like Trump, but that's, that's where I am on that. So, uh, so what does that mean for down ballot races if, as we've been talking about this? And I think, as, uh, as one of our good colleagues has talked about, is the turnout. The turnout is key. And it's not just the passions of the voters that bring them out. It's the mechanics of the political parties. Now, say what you want about whether political parties are still relevant. But the people who work in those buildings on Hillsborough Street are responsible in great, in large parts of getting voters out. And we know that the, the Republican Party is experiencing some disarray um, at the moment. And I don't cheer about this because it's happened to Democrats and it's really hard when it's happening to your party. So it's not fun for anyone. And if Trump is the nominee and donors decide that they're not going to give money um, to, to, to Trump, who do they give it to? Now, if they're Republicans, do they give it to, who, do they give it to the Republican Party? Um, and if so, where and which caucus and who gets the money? And so you've got some real, you've got some real logistical problems on getting the money in order to get the turnout. On the Democratic side, um, Democrats have struggled with their field game for the last couple of uh, election cycles, presidential election cycles, certainly. And so in the past, in 2008, certainly the election that I'm most familiar with, um, they have outsourced it to Obama, but Hillary no longer has that kind of strong uh, field game that Obama had. So how does that relate to voter turnout? How many minutes I got left? Um, four minutes and 32 seconds. Hot damn. So, <laughs> so you know, so whether, um, and so we've seen in the 2008 and 2012 elections on a national uh, front that you can't just have all white people in order to win. Um, Republicans are going to have to form coalitions with their non-base if they want to win. It's not just because of, um, of demographics changing, it's because the world is changing. And so even if you win this election cycle with just your base voters, in the future, you're going to think about how do I get to those other, those quote unquote other voters who as the good uh, professor mentioned that are growing in numbers. So that's another thing that we need to think about in terms of down ballot. So for president, I, I do see um, both Trump and Clinton on the ballot. I do think that if, if Trump is on the ballot uh, as a Republican, not as a third party person, I do agree that Hillary Clinton wins, but not by the landslide that everybody is predicting. I think that um, Hillary Clinton has some serious trouble in uh, the Democratic voters, she's going to have to convince the Bernie supporters to vote for her. And in the primary elections, especially when, um, when we bring in the unmarried women, there was a lot of insulting rhetoric by Madeleine Albright and Gloria Steinem to unmarried women. And they're gonna have to bring those women back into the fold. And I know that since we don't have a black candidate on the ballot that black voters aren't sexy this season, but you know what, they're pissed off too. So um, you know you've got to get you've got to convince them that they need to vote for Hillary that she's their best bet, um, and I'm greatly entertained by the two African American women who are Trump supporters. I think it's like Precious and whatever their names are, and they're from Fayetteville, Silk and Leather or whatever their names are. They're just <laughs> wonder <laughs> great, uh, and I love the fact that they're stumping for for Trump because it shows America that African Americans are not a monolith. So um, I find that interesting as well. And then um, on the the down ballot races, I definitely see uh, Richard Burr uh, because of his national security credentials with a lot of the terrorist attacks in Europe, particularly Paris and Brussels. Um, there is a concern, um, and we always sort of see those stories about well, when is it going to happen to us, and you know our turn could be coming. So I think Burr stays in. I do think, as everyone has said, that the uh, governor's race is tight knit. I mean, right now, um, I, I do see it's close between Cooper and McCrory. I'm actually giving Cooper the edge because of what the professor said about jobs moving out of North Carolina as a result of HB2. We do not know at this point whether the threats are just threats or if they're actually going to happen. I'm not sure whether it's, it's 
great that it, it, for Republicans, that it fires up their base. I think it has serious consequences if not only that base, uh, if that base starts to lose their jobs as a result of their moral stance. So um, that's how I see that race going. And really quickly, do I have? Okay, uh, congressional races. I'm really interested in the 12th and the 13th. Um, I was on Tim's show last week, and I said I was going to run my cat Oscar uh, <laughs> in the 13th. Um, he already has a campaign manager, and we have already he done. A filing deadline. He did. That he did. We're going to write him in. We're going to do a feline writing. Feline deadline. Feline deadline. So. Um, is Oscar liked among the unmarried women? <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually, he, there's a, his owner is an unmarried woman. He's going south. By choice. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I'm really interested in the 12th because you know. Know, under the current maps, you know, that was the quote unquote black district. So, you know, will we have a case in which we only have one African American uh, congressman from North, from North Carolina? And so, what does that look like? And um, I'm not going to make any predictions there, but I just will say that I'm watching that race considerably. And the legislative races, I'm interested in the open seats um, to see whether. Uh, people who, who I love, like Tom Apodaca, the kingmakers, if they actually do make the kings and queens and get to say who the next person's going to be, or if the voters are just like, forget you, I'm going to vote for the person that I'm most interested in. So those are my quick predictions. I'll start on the presidential thing. I, I've been telling my friends for ever since uh, Trump got into the race, uh, never say never. I mean, think about who was never, ever going to be president of the United States. That tricky Dick Nixon. He was never going to be president of the United States. Surely we're never going to elect an actor who's been divorced <laughs> presidency of the United States. Some peanut farmer from Georgia? Nah, that's not going to happen. A philanderer from Arkansas? Never going to be president of the United States. And I know all of us sitting here in this room never believed in our lifetime we would see a Barack Hussein Obama be president of the United States. Um, I don't actually think that Donald Trump is the first reality TV candidate. I think Donald Trump is the first TV reality candidate. And that what Trump has gotten really strongly is, is that most of our perceptions and everything that we go through life or most of us is shaped by television. And, you know, he is completely focused on the now and on the, on the moment. And it's worked pretty well for him. And he's taken advantage of the fact that particularly in the Republican base for years, have been promised the moon, promised the moon, promised the moon, when, when their leaders knew they couldn't possibly deliver it. Promising you're going to repeal Obamacare when you know they weren't going to be able to do it is creating that resentment. Um, as to what ends up happening at the end, I, here's one prediction for you. I think Rule 40B will come into place, that you're going to see the Trump and Cruz people get together to stack rules the Rules Committee as best they can, and that uh, John Kasich's gonna have a hard time actually ever being nominated into their convention and that the nominee will be either Trump or Ted Cruz. Uh, I would have said up until this week, uh, it was gonna be Trump for sure, but you know, and certainly we've thought, I mean, most of the people in this room have said, oh, he's done it now, that's never gonna do it, but he may have in fact perhaps stepped in it this week by the big third rail always with getting involved with uh, abortion politics. If Trump is the nominee, I do think you will see a m many more ticket splitters this year. Uh, you'll have Republicans who can't bring themselves to vote for a guy who, uh, yeah, I, I mean, ironically, somebody said that uh, candidate who, that uh, Hillary Clinton, or I, I apologize, who spent the Vietnam War saying my personal heck in Vietnam was having to cheat on my wife all the time. And he was certainly uh, someone who has not served in the military or anything. So I think there'll be a ticket splitting there. Likewise, I do think there'll be working class Democrats and people like the sisters, who I hope they've capitalized that and are making some money on what they're doing, uh, will be voting for Donald Trump. So I think you'll see a lot of ticket splitting up and down the ballot. Uh, I think here in North Carolina, you know, we've had some surprises too. I don't think anybody in this room likely thought that the court case on the districts would have succeeded. One thing we do know that, once again, though, that on a sort of a consistent basis when it comes to redistricting with the North Carolina General Assembly, women generally usually come out on the short end of it. Uh, we have this year where Renee Elmer's pretty much had, you know, her district taken away, so we're over 60% of it is now, or 56% of it, I think, is George Holdings District. And I'm, I'll make a prediction right now, George Holdings is going <laughs> to uh, roll, roll in that race for sure, because the 
Super PAC is going to come in. They are going to spend money. So that's going to be one less woman congressman we're going to have. And then they took a, another woman congressman and moved her an hour and a half, moved her district an hour and a half away. Um, and you know, there's a fair chance that you know she might not be able to overcome that. It's a big hurdle, particularly with these uh, large fields and no runoffs. And the I, the being able to run while you're I call it the uh, the free shot rule, or I actually called it the Andrew Brock rule because I thought that the whole purpose of that was to help Andrew Brock. And I think Andrew Brock will likely be the nominee in the new 13th, particularly with all those candidates. I don't think they'll be, you know, he's got enough of a base there. It includes almost his entire state Senate district that I think he's likely to be the nominee when it comes to that. Uh, I will give kudos to the General Assembly uh, when dealing with the redistricting in that they did something that all too often they haven't done, which is they didn't go for everything. They didn't go for try to get it all. They made districts that looked better, that were compact, and th therefore they're likely to be uh, approved, I think, likely by the, the three-judge panel. Can't really quite say probably the same thing when it comes to HB2. If they would have stuck to bathrooms, it probably wouldn't have become the firestorm uh, that it is. I, I thought that was some pretty <laughs> tremendous spin by Larry to say that the business is gonna love it because of the uh, minimum wage isn't gonna go up. And then at the end, he's saying that you know companies and corporations need to raise their workers' pay. Um, How is it going to play? I, you know, certainly when you have over a hundred really major corporations like you know Facebook, Google, Dow, Apple, you know, kind of taking on Apple, and it, that's not really going to be great for us down the road bit as far as economic development. Uh, in the fall, the races as they're going to go, the Democrats are going to say that. The Republicans raised taxes on working and middle class families in order to cut taxes for uh, out of state corporations and the wealthy, and they're squeezing education and they're impacting the things that made North Carolina the best place to come live, work, and play. The Republicans are going to talk about how they created jobs and we got economy, and that Democrats want men to come into women's bathrooms. And, you know, it is not a new thing. We've seen that before. Bathrooms have often been a cudgel for, you know, try to fear monger to, uh, against a misunderstood minority to legalize discrimination in order to get votes. And it, it has worked, and it very well may work again this year. I, I don't know, but uh, I think we, it, it's, I do think that by going to more than, if they just left it to the bathrooms, they probably wouldn't have had the uh, pushback that they've had. And the other thing about HB2 is, <laughs> it's not just the LGBT community, it's people in this room. All of us can now be fired for our religion, or for some other reason, and you now have no state option. You can't go to state court anymore to have any kind of redress. And so I do think that that will have an impact somewhere down the line. Uh, when we get to council state races, there has been at least one council state woman who's lost before, and that, of course, was Bev Perdue. Uh, council state races, though, are much harder to win than they are to lose. I think that, uh, you know, usually it takes someone like when John Brooks had a problem with the uh, the, the chicken plant fire. Uh, I don't think Steve Troxler will likely have any trouble with his race. I do think that the attorney general's race will be pretty close. And I'd also agree with Larry that uh, whether we're gonna elect our first Jewish council state member or not will have an impact on it. That's also a race where HB2 very well may have an impact. The one race on the council state that I'd have to have uh, full disclosure, I'm working with Charles Meeker. But the fact that Sherry Berry has had a lot of press that she hasn't been doing her job might provide an opening for Charles Meeker to be able to win that race, particularly if uh, Hillary Clinton takes the state to say why. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNCTV network.